All right, so L2012. So originally, uh, ELF was released with the uh, Unix system V stuff a long time ago in the 80s. Um, and, well, I don't know. I just copied and pasted directly from this uh, history lesson. And so it's just saying basically that uh, ELF started out with you know, System V, which Sun was working on, and this basically came to eventually be the dominant format for Linuxes and Unixes and uh, all, variant, you know, all variants of Unix, basically, including Linux. So ELF stands for Executable and Linkable Format, and we're going to focus on uh, x86-64 version of it. So you can uh, check out the previous class uh, slides and the previous class video for, uh, for the 32-bit version, but it's basically the same, more or less. Um, the official documentation for the 32-bit uh, ABI, Application Binary Interface, is hosted at SCO.com. SCO are the people who started trying to, uh, you know, say claim that they had copyrights on, on Unix and they owned Unix and anybody like the Linuxes who were using things had to pay up. So they were generally disliked, became a sort of a copyright troll. But uh, originally they were just sort of a, a Unix company. All right, so previously your best friends were PEView and CFF Explorer. Your new best friends are ReadElf, LDD, and Objstone. But in reality, ReadElf is going to be the, the major one, the nerdy one here. That's, that's the one that's good. So ReadElf will be able to basically, it's going to be a command line program, which is going to slice apart the ELF files. It'll print out the first level headers, which would be sort of analogous to the uh, DOS header or kind of a little bit of the DOS header and a little bit of the uh, optional header. Well, I don't want to get into that. We'll get there. ReadElf will slice apart the headers and it'll show you the various information about sections and basic headers and uh, stuff like that. LDD can show you which libraries uh, the executable depends on. So that means sort of like what does it import, right? What shared libraries does it import from? And Objstump, you haven't had to try x86, but Objstump can be useful for uh, disassembling the thing and, you know, just getting a flat uh, view of the assembly. So, uh, I kind of showed before at the very beginning, if you remember way back at the beginning of the PE stuff, I showed where there's like a single uh, option that you would pull down box that you'd have in Visual Studio where it says, I would like to compile this source code to an exe. I would like to compile it to a DLL. I would like to compile it to a lib file. All right, so here on Linux, as we'll be using today, you'll use uh, GCC as your primary compiler. And so if you just do a default GCC-O, your out file, and then whatever source files, default you're going to get a dynamic linked executable. So that means it's not going to put all the code in. It's like a default Windows executable. You're going to import from other libraries. As we'll see later, the imports do not work like the Windows imports. They work like the delay load imports. So whereas Linux... Whereas Windows uh, resolves all imports at startup and then will call stuff as necessary, Linux will use this delay loaded import basically exactly the same way as Windows uses delay loaded import. Point to a stub code and then the stub code calls the equivalent of load library and get proc address. So that's the kind of binary you'll get if you just do a default GCC compile. If you do dash static, you're now going to get something where it's going to gather up all of the different libraries that you're using and it's going to plop all of that code into your binary and make sure that, it, you know, your binary knows where to call all of the functions within yourself. And so this obviously leads to extremely large code. You should see some uh, code size comparisons later. Then um, if you're compiling a shared library, you're generally going to want to use the dash F pick option. So PIC stands for position independent code. And so if you don't have to use the PIC option, but if you use the PIC option, well, it's, it's a trade-off. So I, I maybe should have showed both ways on the slide, but there's a trade-off. You can make a library that's going to be sort of like a normal DLL on Windows where you're going to have relocation information. And so it'll, again, compile code that will have assumptions about I'm going to load at this base address and I'm going to hard code those constants into my assembly and into my headers. If you use the dash F pick, it won't compile any of those hard-coded constants into the assembly. 
it'll generate code which dynamically looks up offsets to things. So this code can take can run a little bit slower because it's always having to calculate stuff at runtime. It'll always say like, okay, let me get the base address of this and put it into this register, and now I know it's base address plus something. And so it'll always be resolving its things uh, at, at, as it runs along in the code. So, um, but anyways, with GCC, this is kind of a couple stage process. First, you're going to use the dash C option, which tells you compile it, but don't link it. So if you go to the very beginning where class where I said bunch of .c files go into the compiler, a bunch of O files come out. Here we're talking about uh, you use the dash C and you're going to <coughs> have this particular C file turn into this particular dash o, dot .o file. So lib foo.o, if you're calling it foo. This is just by convention, Linux will typically call your library lib whatever, lib pcap, lib nids. All right, so lib whatever dot o gets output and then you use ld to link this, um, this thing as a shared library and you give it the so name, so it's saying short, shared object name is lib foo dot so dot one and this is going to be the output file. So it's just kind of following particular conventions set up by Linux. All right, and so if you want to build a static library where you've got a bunch of stuff, this is kind of the case that's more like the .lib file I was talking about before. The static library is where it's not an actual ELF file. It's more like a collection of .o files with a little bit of header information at the beginning saying, you know, I've got an a archive. This is why we use the AR command. You're typically going to call it a .a file and you're going to use the archive thing. It's an archive of .o files so that if someone wants to do static linking, you can say, here's all of the .o files that you need to link against in order to put stuff together. So again, two-stage process. First, you compile all of your files to get a bunch of dash o files using this dash c. And then you use archive to combine, uh, create and replace existing o files with this uh, dash a file. So you're just taking a bunch of o files, pretty much putting them into an array with a little header information on the front. And then later on, if you're wanting to um, if you're wanting to link against this, you'll use uh, GCC and you'll use dash L and that will include this, uh, the code from this in your thing, even if you're not using the uh, static linking. <clears throat> All right, so as with Windows where we had to get on the same page in terms of a D word equals four bytes, Q word equals eight bytes, uh, these are the Linux, these are the ELF sizes rather. And so, when ELF says word, it does mean, it, oh, so whereas on Windows, word meant 16 bytes and a D word meant 32. On ELF, word means four bytes. So what was a D word before is a, a word now. And what was a word before was a half now. So unfortunately, these are just the kind of things where hopefully you get to work in a situation where you're not having to flip back and forth, but you know, if you're having to port code from Windows to Linux, you have to go back and forth between these things all the time. But anyways, we're talking about 64-bit, and so addresses are always eight bytes large because, you know, we're dealing with 64-bit addresses, and offsets are 64-bit as well. Yep, and so just as a notional thing for yourself, if it's calling itself an underscore adder, it's saying it's a virtual address kind of thing. And if it's saying underscore offset, that's more like a file offset, as it says right over here. Program address, address means virtual address, file offset for the other one. All right, so these are the two kind of views that we're going to be looking at an ELF file from. So there's a linking view and there is an execution view. And so typically this linking view is what you'll have in .o files. And so the linker wants this kind of information, not this section information, whereas an executable will typically have this information. But the interesting thing is that, okay, so whereas when you're linking, you don't necessarily need this program header at the beginning, but you need these section headers which talk about each of these sections. Over at executable, you have this program header that points at all these segments, and this section header is optional. But what we'll see is that typically, an executable will have both the program header and the section header so that you kind of have these two views merged together. You've got information about segments and you've got information about sections. And I'll have to kind of clarify what a section is versus what a segment is versus what we were talking about in Windows. All right. So I think I started to have some decent, better slides now for this. 
All right, so back to this kind of linking view of thinking of a linker as a splicing engine, splicing together all of these different uh, object files. So this object file means .o file. So you've got some headers on here. This would be, actually, I guess in this sense, it should be at the bottom. It's more of the, the section header information. And section headers talk about section headers talk about sections. And sections here are still things that are named like .text, .ro, .data, and so forth. And the linker is basically trying to take these and put them together so that the .text stuff goes together and the .ro stuff goes together. And so how we're basically going to think about this, what we're going to see in, there's these two views, but when we look at our actual binaries that are compiled, we're going to be seeing these views uh, together. And the read elf stuff will often show us, like, try to show us how the sections map to segments and things like that. So this is more concretely what we're going to see in our files when we make them apart. There's going to be some elf headers at the very beginning. And then within the elf headers, there's going to be pointer to the program headers. There's going to be a pointer to the section headers. Because it, it, it is much simpler in this sense that you've got the first order headers, and then there's two other kinds of headers beyond that. And each of those headers then point at segments or at sections. So once you get to the program headers, it's basically going to say, I have this many segments after uh, my program headers. And segments are what's going to be actually mapped into memory later on, as we'll see. Whereas the section headers are basically saying, here are all of the different types of information. Here are the different things like .text, which is trying to tell you that this is code, and .ro data that's trying to tell you this is, uh, this is read-only data. As far as the OS loader is concerned, it only cares about these segments. Segments either say, like, take this chunk of file and put it in memory, and things like that. Whereas, like I said, the linker cares more about sections, but also um, some other programs that may want to, to uh, may want to interact with the ELF file may care about sections. Things debuggers will, will often care about sections. 